Ai, nem mandou. Welcome to the broadcast. My name is Dr. David Simmons. This is Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus is king of the cowboys and everybody's welcome. What that means is God has no respect for persons. We're glad you're here. Listen to the word today because the word of God will change your life. The Bible tells us that it's in the inspired word of God. It was given for correction for instruction in righteousness and so we have to remember that it will change our life every time we hear it by the washing of the water of the word so listen to the word enjoy it and I'll talk to you at the end so father I just thank you this day as we have made room for you by coming to worship and fellowship together, Father, to honor you according to your word. I just speak blessings, Father, over all of our friends and family that are traveling, uh, those that are still out at the National Finals Rodeo right now, Father. I just ask for safety uh, for the participants, the livestock, Father, and their families as they return home. And we give you all the glory regardless of the outcome of scores. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you keeping score? Anybody been watching? I, I don't like to watch. <laughs> I don't like to watch. Uh, of course, you always want your friends to win, right? We always want our friends to win. And so I was like, oh, you know, and then so when they, when they don't, you know, when they miss, and then you're like, oh, you know, and you know how they feel, right? I mean, you just, and I, and I, it, all right, we don't know how they feel. Um, and um, so many times, and it, it, it falls into what I'm going to be speaking about today in relationship to, are you all right? You ever anybody ask you that? Are you all right? You all right, right? You all right? And so, um, I, I really thought about that, and, and, and probably uh, for lots of different circumstances, um, there's a you know, if, if you're asking the question, something's up, right? I mean, because obviously if everything's great going on in life, do you ask your, does, do people ask you that question? You know, so generally there's something going on. And so today um, we are going to talk about um, that specifically, about being right, about being all right, but we're going to talk about our attitude. And it's about the attitude of the branch, I have been um, always looking at um, the past fathers of faith and their teachings. And if you've never studied Andrew Murray, he has some amazing teachings out there. Andrew Murray was a minister um, and a worker uh, in Africa uh, back in the 1800s. He passed on in 1917. And from the time that he started his work till the time that he finished his work, he was always writing down things for us to glean from, just as the writers of the Bible did, so that we have uh, instructions and things set before us. And I am so glad, amen, that there are instructions. Aren't you glad there's a road map? Amen. Somebody said, uh, and many times I've heard people say, I wish children came with instructions. Technically, they did. Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. God is always leading us and directing us as to what we should be doing in every circumstance. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, um, the very definition of right, being right, um, when we think about being right, are you right? Means you're not wrong, right? Are you right? So I think about, uh, you know, I've heard the, the statement about the, the, right, the right wing. So is the right wing right? No comments. Okay. So, and then there's the left wing, right? But, but being right, and, and I'm going to come around to this in a minute, um, is about the right time, being on the right path, being in the right way. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about just knowing that 
You are where you should be at the right time and all times. Um, that you are safe, that you are well. You know, uh, when somebody says, are you all right? They want to know, are you all right? Are you okay? Are you, how are you feeling? Um, and, and with that, sometimes um, I think that we have a tendency to not be forthcoming because it's personal. You know, when you're not feeling well, with things going on in our lives, um, we don't always want to, you know, talk about it. And I think at this time of year, um, and in many situations when uh, I've been very sensitive to that, just with the, the passing of our friends and family members this year, um, we know that we're not completely all right in all those situations, amen? But that we're getting there because we're still on the right path. We are all right. You, everyone is all right. It's just that we have things that we're going through and we don't always know what to say. So those are the words that we choose. So uh, in talking about the branch <clears throat> and the way of our lives, everything depends on our being right ourselves in Christ. Being right in Christ, being sure of our salvation and our Savior. If I want good apples, I must have a good apple tree. If I care for the health of the apple tree, the apple tree will give me good apples, as it is with our Christian life and work. And our life with Christ, if, excuse me, our life with Christ is where it should be, we will always be right. We'll always follow the right path, and we'll always end up in the right place. There may be need for instruction, suggestions, help, training in certain areas, different departments of our Christian life to see what really is of value. You are all so valuable. We are valuable to God. We are valuable to one another. And there are things I think a lot of times that um, we will encounter where people are really stressing over stuff that in the end, the value behind it is not the focus of what God would want us to have. But in the long run, the greatest essential is to have the full life in Christ. And that is what I want. And that's what I want for everybody else. In other words, to have Christ in us and working through us. Amen? And so that, that is the focus of this message today. You know, and I know how much there is to disturb us, to distract us, to cause us to be anxious, to bring questions about. But you know, the master has such a blessing for every one of us and such perfect peace and rest, and such great joy and strength. And I know I haven't been here for all of the lighting of the Advent candles and in the thought of it, but just, just the words that are already up, hope, peace, and joy. Amen? And that's what God has for us. And of course, that's what the enemy wants to take away from us because he doesn't have it. He doesn't have peace. He doesn't have hope, and he doesn't have joy. I love that my father is always looking out for me. Don't you? Always, always looking out for you. With just that perfect peace and rest and such great joy and strength. If we can only come into and be kept in the right attitude toward him. So if you look over at John 15:5. depending upon the translation you have, they all say pretty much the same thing. I am the vine, and you are the branches. So today we're going to focus on especially those words. You are the branches. So who's the vine? God, Jesus, God, that's right. What a simple thing it is to be a branch. The branch of a tree or the branch of a vine. The branch grows out of the vine or out of the tree. And there it lives and it grows. And in due time, it bears fruit. It has no responsibility 
except just to receive from the root and stem the sap and the nourishment that it needs. And if we, only by the Holy Spirit, knew our relationship to Jesus Christ, our work would be changed into the brightest and most heavenly thing upon earth. I can't think of anything better than to stand here today and every day and talk about what our Lord wants for us. And everyone that I encounter every day, in the busyness of work, in the nonchalantness of our lives, it is always still my main focus. And I don't, not that I would want to imagine not doing it. I can't imagine that I will not be doing it for the rest of my life until my last breath. I hope that that will always be my focus in talking about it. Amen? Amen. So again, the branch has no responsibility except to receive from the root. Instead of there being soul weariness or exhaustion, our work would be like a new experience, linking us to Jesus as nothing else can. It should not be that our work comes between us and Jesus. And I made a note here, how can that be? But I have seen it time and time again. The very work that he has for us to do, for people to do, seems to take them away. And it separates them from Christ. Many a laborer in the vineyard has complained that he too has too much work and not time for close communion with Jesus and that his usual work weakens his inclination for prayer and it darkens their spiritual life. We all have things to do every day, all day. It was in the Bible, Adam and Eve were to tend the garden. So we know that there is always things for us to do day in and day out. And sometimes those things in our lives, they should not separate us from our service to the kingdom of the Lord. Amen? Our service and our ministry to, to the Lord and what he wants from us. And so when I, I wrote this about the soul weariness and exhaustion, every time somebody says, oh, you do so much. And I don't mean to be like, and I don't know what I usually respond because I hear it quite often. Um, I, I don't even think about that. You know, if I'm tired, it, it, I may have overextended myself, but I find no greater service than to do what I do day in and day out. On Friday, I mean, yeah, Friday, um, my 4-H group, the homeschool group, had their Christmas, their our party here. We had a Christmas party. And I mean, and it was... It was tremendous. We had 40 students that came, and I mean, this place looked like a bomb blew up afterwards. And several of the moms, as they were staying to help clean up, um, and, and I said, that, I said, thank you so much, you know, for staying to clean up. And they said, oh, we would not want you to have to be left to do this by yourself. But I never expected them to. I do things, it's kind of like in Wendy the other night, a Bible study stayed and helped me clean. And so when we have a fellowship here. But that's part of the ministry of what I do and why I do it. It just brings me joy. And to some people, it looks like a lot of work. But it's not a lot of work at all. It is, I have joy in setting it up. I have joy in doing what I do. And um, David's kind of laughing, sitting there a little bit. Uh, <laughs> because he thinks it's a lot of work too, but he's not doing it. He's just... <laughs> so, and, and he'll see, tell me that. He'll go, you work so hard. And I, I try, but I try to not get caught in that is what I'm trying to say. So I, I, I hope I don't ever appear not appreciative of that thought process, but I really just don't look at it as work. Because if it was work, I don't know that I'd want to do it. You know, and so all of our service to the Lord should be that way though. It shouldn't be like work. It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be weary in it. Amen? And the Bible talks about it time and time again. And I think what, what is sad, it, it saddens me that the bearing of fruit should separate the branch from the vine. You know, and so I think, you know, it must be because, you know, we've looked upon our work as something other than 
the brand, myself bearing fruit. Amen? I pray that God will deliver us from every false thought about our Christian life and our service to him. And so looking at this attitude of the branch and looking at the blessedness, how blessed we all are, and um, being in that place all the time where we feel that we are blessed, there are four things um, that we'll be looking at. And first one, the first one is absolute dependence on the vine. Abs deep restfulness, number two. The abundant fruitfulness, number three. And a close communion is number four. The four areas that we always want to look at and concentrate that we're going to talk about today. And so um, I'm going to uh, read something that I, I read. Um, what does it mean to be in Christ? So in Galatians 26 through 28, it gives us insight into the phrase in Christ and what it means. In Christ Jesus, you were all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves with Christ. Neither, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male or female. We are all, you are all one in Christ. Paul is speaking to the Christians in Galatia, reminding them of their new identity. I want you to remember that. New identity since they placed their faith in Jesus Christ. To be baptized into Christ means that they were identified with Christ, having left their old sinful lives and fully embracing the new life in Christ. When we respond to the Holy Spirit's drawing, he baptizes us into the family of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. In the English Standard Version, it says, And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Amen? And so that has to do with the, um, how we identify ourselves and so early in ministry, and, and we've talked about it before, um, I never understood denominations. I wasn't even aware they were, there were some. I knew all churches had different signs and postings, but it never crossed my mind that everybody didn't think the same way as I did about what the Bible said. Because the Bible said it, then it's true, right? And it's right. I didn't know that there were all these opinions about, uh, from a negative, from a negative standpoint, I didn't realize there was negative opinions about the Word of God. I thought it was just all so glorious and perfect, you know, and that, that zeal is what we're kind of talking about here as well. It's a horrible place to be when you lose your zeal for the Lord. That weariness that I talked about, that, that place where we know that we're just not right. Something's wrong. We don't feel right. We don't feel like we're either uh, being, you know, useful or in a place of gratitude. We find it difficult to, for, to have joy. We feel like we've, maybe there's not a lot of hope and there's definitely no peace. No one, no one wants to be there, right? No one wants to be there and I don't want anyone to be there. And so I find great joy in assisting or helping wherever I can to help people in that place. And that is what is part of the fruit that I have. Amen? And it's also part of the fruit that you have. So abundant dependence, absolute. I, we could use both words, so absolute dependence, number one. In the first place, it is a life of absolute dependence. The branch has nothing. It just depends upon the vine for everything. Absolute dependence is one of the most quieting and precious thoughts. God is everything. Think about the angels. God is everything to the angels. And he is willing to be everything to us as well. If we can learn every moment of the day to depend upon God, everything will come out right. You will get the higher life if you depend absolutely upon God. And so you might be saying, well, how do you do that? Because I don't feel that way right now. We find it with the vine and the branches. Every vine you see or every bunch of grapes that comes upon your table, let it remind you that the branch is absolutely dependent upon the vine. The vine has to do the work. The branch 
just enjoys the fruit of it. So think about if you didn't do anything but just enjoy the fruits of your labor. We've seen that scripture, right? Enjoy the fruits of your labor. So what is the vine to do? It has to do a great work. It has to send its roots out into the soil and hunt under the ground. The roots often extend a long way out for nourishment and to drink in the moisture. It needs certain elements to, in fertilizers, so it has to go a certain, certain directions to find, and the vine sends its roots there. And then in its roots or sterns, it turns the moisture and the fertilizer into that special sap, which is to make the fruit that is born. The vine does the, the work and the branch just has to receive it. And then it's changed into grapes. I read that there's a place in London at Hampton Court, there's a vine that sometimes bore a couple thousand bunches of grapes and people were astonished at its large growth and rich foliage. After it was discovered that uh, what it was the cause of it, not so very far away, the river Thames and the vine had stretched its roots away hundreds of yards under the ground until it came to the riverside. And there in all the rich slime of the riverbed, it found rich nourishment and obtained moisture and the roots had drawn the sap all the distance up into the vine. And as a result, there was an abundant rich harvest. The vine had to do all the work. It is so difficult for us to let Jesus and God do all the work. And I think that's when I know if I'm tired, I'm trying to do things of my own strength and by my own might. And I'm not tapping in to what God wants me to tap into. And so in this analogy here that we're looking at with the vine and the branch, the roots and the vine, Jesus is the vine, Jesus is the tree. You know, we, we see these analogies throughout the Bible. And I thought about the grapes when Joshua, when they went into the promised land and those huge bunches of grapes, right? And how big it was because the promises of God were there waiting to supply, amen, in the promised land. And so that promised land is, it's at your house. It's at your job. It's here today. That promised land that God wants us to be tapping into is abundant, amen? And the branch just has to receive. Hallelujah. Jesus and God, they do all the work if we let them. Isn't that literally true, though, of the Lord Jesus? You know, I understand when I have to work and I get to preach. I wrote have to, but I don't have to do anything. Uh, I get to work. I get to preach, I get to have a sermon, I get to do a Bible study class or, or go out and visit the poor and answer the call of neglected ones on the phone. You know, yet used to, they didn't have phones like they do now and so, you know, people just call all the time. But, you know, people used to just show up at the doorstep. I've, I've heard stories anyway, We've, we don't have it happen too often. Um, but... Um, when people are neglected and you look at the phone and you go, oh, I don't have, I'm going to have to call them back. Yeah, I know you don't ever do that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't have time to talk to them right now. Now, that could be true, but for the most part, and I got a phone call yesterday and she said, I am so glad you answered the phone. Now, I knew when the phone call came across that this was going to be a conversation. And, and I, was, I was busy, but... I had to make that decision at that moment that I wasn't, I'm never too busy to answer a call. Amen? And so, you know, a lot of times, even with David, David may call and I'll go, hey, I'm in the middle of something. Can I call you back? You know, to make sure of that's the case. No. Yes, he said no. 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 But what's important is that I answered. Right? Amen. He'll, he'll tell you. That's right. Well, that is exactly what Christ wants you to understand. Christ wants that in all your work. The very foundation should be the simple, blessed consciousness that Christ must care for all. And not everybody's easy to care for. Amen. 
How does he fulfill the trust of that dependence? He does it by sending down the Holy Spirit. Not now and then as a special gift, as you might have read in the word. For remember, the relationship between the vine and the branch is such that it's an hourly, daily, unceasing relationship that the living connection is maintained between the vine and the branches. Continually, the roots and the vine. And the vine produces the roots and pushes them out. And so God, sometimes you may feel like you get into a little bit of slime and a little bit of muck. And I read a, 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 one of the, Andrew Murray was talking about, he says, you know, Manure is the best fertilizer. Sometimes getting a little dirty out there in some very uncomfortable situations and stepping off can be some of the best fertilizer for your walk in the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. And just, you know, my Lord Jesus wants me to take that blessed position as a worker. Morning by morning, day by day, hour by hour, step by step. In every work I have or get to do, to go out and just abide before him in simple, utter helplessness of one who knows nothing and is nothing and can do nothing aside from him. I want to encourage you to seek out uh, and study, if you're looking for something to study, the word nothing. We sometimes sing, you know, oh, to be uh, nothing apart from him. But you, if you've really studied out the word and prayed every day and worshiped God in the light of it, do you know the blessedness of the word nothing? If I am something, then God is not everything. But when I become nothing, God can become all. And the everlasting God in Christ can reveal himself fully. And so when I think about that we reflect Christ, because we say these words all the time, you're Christians, what does that mean to be in Christ? And so that's why I read that, uh, that I had read about being in Christ. That he is in us, we are in him, but he is what shines that, that I do not shine, that it is not anything that I can even begin to possibly do. It is a higher way of life. We need to become nothing. Can you become nothing? Do you have to become something? And we all know a lot of people. I was uh, watching something the other day and, uh, on television, and um, a mother and a daughter were... having difficulty in the relationship is the best way I can put it. And the daughter felt like she wasn't um, appreciated, that she was um, looked down upon by her mother. And so she, she made a statement about how strong she was. And the mother said, well, you know, if you have to say it about yourself, then you're just bragging. And and as they, they came together, and I, and I thought about that in light of what I'm talking about today, was that she felt like she needed to be something. When what if she had this revelation that she didn't need to be anything to be everything? Hang on, hang with me here, okay? <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's a full circle, but it is a circle. To become nothing in deep reality as a worker Study only one thing, to become less and lower and more helpless. And Andrew Murray was talking about this and how he trained people in discipleship for ministry to become so dependent upon the Lord and to be less than all things that are set before them. And I, I often, when we look at the scriptures where it talks about being humble and being meek and uh, lowly, these words that they use in the Bible, and I was always like, but, but I'm a Christian, I'm strong, and I'm powerful, and I'm mighty. And the Lord reminded me through this study that no, I'm nothing aside from him. Amen. And in him, 
I am powerful because he is powerful. Not because I'm powerful. Not because I can do all of these things, but because he can do all these things and I allow him to use me to do them. Amen? And that's where the strength comes from. If I am something, then God is not everything. But when I become nothing, God can become all. And the everlasting God in Christ can reveal himself fully. Again, I say, that is the higher life. Someone has said, uh, I, I read that the seraphim and the cherubim are flames of fire. And that's all they are. Because they are nothing outside of God. And they allow God to put his fullness and glory and brightness into them. This consuming, cleansing fire does not come from within. It comes from above. And so when we talk about, you know, we sing, right? Cleanse me, Lord. Let the fire burn away. All of these things. Do you mean it? I love that song. I love, and when I, and, and, and I do, when I, when, I, when I listen to worship and I think about the things that we sing, um, and sometimes they can seem um, difficult, I search for the words. Why does it say that? What did the writer mean when he was asking to be put, to be cleansed by fire? Because the fire, just like here, will cleanse us and make us pure as God had created us. To become nothing in deep reality as a worker, less and low and more helpless. And when I read that, you might have thought, oh, I, know. I already feel helpless. It's not the same thing. It's knowing that all of our strength comes from the Lord. Or maybe it is. Maybe, maybe it is a place where we need to be, that Christ can work all in us. So my first lesson was learn to be nothing. Learn to be helpless. The man who has something is not absolutely dependent, but the man who has nothing is absolutely dependent. We talked about this briefly in uh, Friday night Bible study. Uh, it was mentioned about um, that it's, uh, and I'm going to forget it again, it's harder for a rich man, Pastor Ivan Needle, than... to get into heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. And I always pondered upon that thought, that scripture, and I thought, why is that scripture saying that? Because then that's where a lot of religion, right, teaches, oh, you can't have money, or you, you know, you can't do this, and you have to, you know, you have to, and that wasn't what he was talking about. It was talking about realizing that the prosperity that we have, that the abundance of life that we have is we have it, and we know that. And you know, the majority of people that are sitting here and the majority of people that are going to listen to this message, I hope and believe that they understand that everything we have is not because of anything that we've done, but because we serve our Father and that he does it. Amen? Hallelujah. Absolute dependence upon God is the secret of all power and work. The branch has nothing but what it gets from the vine. And you and I can have nothing but what we get from Jesus. And I think if, if as I am going to continue to study this and as I continue to apply it, that's a better word, apply this in my life, that everything that I get from Jesus, we will not be susceptible to get things distracted by the enemy. We won't, it won't even enter into the system because if we're truly tapped into the vine, I'll guarantee you Jesus isn't tapping into anything that has to do with hell or Satan and all of his stuff here on this planet Earth. So the second thing is deep restfulness. So that goes into that peace. But when I think of being rested, anybody need a little more rest? Okay, I got a few. I got a few. All right. I mean, you think about that. Isn't it nice to be rested? To have a good night's rest? To wake up? Right? Yeah, Lena, Lena needs 12 more hours. That's right. Yeah. Infants need like 15 a day. You know, when you study out how much rest we need. But deep restfulness. Always being at peace. So the second, the second part of this, the life of the branch, is not only a life of entire dependence, but of deep restfulness. That little branch, if it could think, if it could feel, if it could speak, 
that branch out in, in the, at Hampton Court in London and the millions of vines that I grew up surrounding me in California, if we could listen, learn from them to be able to be that dependent upon the vine, because they have no choice. And I want to be in that place where I have no, no choice. And to remind myself that I'm always grafted, not just grafted in, but I am part of it, that it is my staying force. I want to learn how to be that true branch of the living vine. And you asked it, what would its answer? And so, you know, I know that through strength and wisdom that's given to us, that there's one lesson we can all learn. When we're, with all of our hurry and our effort in Christ's work, sometimes it seems like we're not getting ahead. But if we're doing what we're asked to do, I try not to look at the outcome, just do what God told me to do. Amen? We hear a lot of times, and, and it's asked the question, you know, I don't hear about uh, the blessings of God everywhere I go. I'll hear about salvation and messages or I'll hear about different things or people don't preach about healing. And, um, and I had it say to me, it was told to me by another minister, the reason that ministers don't talk about these things is because they think that they're responsible for them. When God is responsible for his word, we're just responsible to give it. You've heard me say this time and time again. And so when, when somebody is sick and things are going terrible in people's life, to be able to say that there is hope and there is a place for them, that there is healing, that there is prosperity, that there is more to the situation. Even if you're not there, keep saying it. Amen. Because the word is true. When the, the vine began to pour its sap into me, so I, 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 um, I read this expert, and it was talking about the branch and what the branch would say. And it says, man, I hear that you are wise, and I know that you can do a great many wonderful things. I know you have much strength and wisdom given to you, but I have one lesson for you. With all your hurry and effort in Christ's work, you never prosper. The first thing you need to, to, is to come and rest in the Lord Jesus. That is what I do. Since I grew out of the vine, I have spent years and years, and all I have done is just rest in the vine. When the time of spring came, I had no anxious thought of care. The vine began to pour its sap into me and to give me bud and leaf. And then the time of summer came, and I had no care. And in the great heat, I trusted the vine to bring moisture to me fresh. And in the time of harvest, when the owner came to pluck the grapes, I had no care. If there was anything in the grapes, not good. The owner never blamed the branch. He always blamed the vine. And if you would be a true branch of Christ, the living vine, just rest on him. Let Christ bear the responsibility. And I thought how important it is. Because a lot of times people think um, that it almost sounds like they're being lazy. And I tell you, it is not. When you really learn to rest upon the Lord, really learn to let him do it, and get out of his way and quit working, you become closer and you allow, just like the vine at harvest time, if you can just rest in him and let him take care of it. And you might think, well, well, well then, you know, what am I supposed to do? Do nothing. Be nothing. Just be in the word. Be in God. And relax and let God work. And so if you're saying, well, how do I let God work? Listen to the Holy Spirit. Tap into that. Because God will let us know what to do amongst our busy days. Begin to work in the midst of your entire dependence by adding to deep restfulness. A man sometimes tries and tries to be dependent upon Christ, but he worries himself about the absolute dependence. He tries and he cannot get it. And this is what I see so many times in people. And then they, they, they just give up and they don't spend the time in the Lord that they should. When we trust him, we sing about it. We talk to people about it. 
But I see the reality of truth in every movement as they talk. They don't know how to rest in the Lord. So when you say, and have you ever, I know you've said it, and I know it's been said to you, it's okay, God's got this. It's going to be okay. If you're saying that to someone, chances are on the other side of it, they don't feel that way. And that's why you're saying it to them. But learning how to rest in the Lord in the midst of adversity, it is, it doesn't take adversity. It shouldn't take, don't wait for adversity to get there. Start on it now. So if you're in a good place now, then just build yourself up in this. My best advice is take your place every day at the feet of Jesus in the peace and the rest that comes from the knowledge of him. We must understand that it is the Lord Jesus who wants to work through you. Unconditional love. Don't know if you think much about it. Do you have it? Do you feel like you have unconditional love? What is the meaning of it? It can only come through Jesus. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And... The love of Christ constrains us. Christ can give you a fountain of love so that you cannot help, so that you cannot help but love the most wretched and the most ungrateful and those who weary you in the place that you are today. If you can learn to rest in Christ, you can give wisdom and strength and you do not know that restful place. It will often prove to be the very best part of your testimony. When you plead with people and you argue, they get the idea, there is a man arguing and striving with me. They only feel. Here are two men dealing with each other. But if you let the deep rest of God come over you, the rest in Christ Jesus, the peace and the rest of holiness of heaven, the restfulness will bring a blessing to your heart and even more than words. And so many times, and I see it many, many places where people will, we're preaching on it, we're learning about it, about the love of the Lord, and that, you know, I just love everybody. Anybody just love everybody? Me. I do. We should all be able to say that. The, and, and I'm thinking about the people that aren't so lovely, right along with you, okay? But... That's something that God really has taught me over the years. And it's something that I know, that I know that I know, that I love them and I love them unconditionally. That doesn't mean that I get into a place where I'm being taken advantage of or used or anything else. It means that I truly, truly want them to go to heaven, to live in peace, and to get out of whatever they're in the middle of. The branch teaches a lesson of much fruitfulness, and we looked at it already, but I want to touch on it just briefly again. That the Lord Jesus Christ repeated the word fruit often in that parable, and in many parables. He spoke first of the fruit, and then of more fruit, and then of much more fruit. And so you were ordained not only to bear fruit, but to bear much fruit. Your life should be full of, of the blessings and of the fruit of God. Because that's what the fruit is, right? It's sweet. It's abundant. It, it, you give it to other people, right? When, when, when a, a vine produces fruit, and we go to Walmart to buy it. But, you know, I'm, I tried to grow a grapevine last year. I hope it didn't die. So, praise the Lord. You know, when we tap into it, we won't die. We will always keep sustaining. We'll always keep going because we don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about watering me if I'm in God. I have to worry about watering my plants, though. They, they should worry about me. That's why I think that things should be planted in the ground. Because, you know, I grow everything in pots out here. And so half the time you'll come in. And if I'm gone out of town, especially, and forgot to have somebody ask to water it, aren't you glad we don't have to forget Jesus never forgets. God never forgets. He is always tapping into it for us. He is always feeding us everything that we need to sustain us, to keep us in a place where we are abundantly blessed. Anne 
Andrew Murray said that um, he felt that, that uh, the world was perishing for the want of workers. And, and so we're talking about the 1800s when he was talking about it. Now he's in Africa and so he had a little bit different type of ministry and we go to Africa so we do understand that in its because it's kind of the same way almost. Um, and it wants not only for more workers but workers that are saying um, more earnestly than others. He said that he needed not only more workers, but he needed his workers to have a new power, a different life. Workers that were able to bring more blessing, children of God. And so he wrote this thing where he was appealing um, to uh, the ministry outside, seeking people to come in. And he says, you know what trouble you take to say in a case of sickness? When a friend apparently in danger of death and nothing can refresh that friend so much as a few new grapes. But they're out of season. And he said, but when we come into a place where he said he would have people in ministry that were working the ministry, that they would get burned out. And so he was constantly bringing in new people into the ministry for new, new workers. And I realize that in discipleship, that um, it is just a continual process. I can't even imagine stopping. I mentioned that before. How I'm, we're all continually doing what we do. You all, from the worship team, to the people that open the door, to the people that clean the toilet and sweep the floor. I don't think I swept the floor, by the way, now that I think about it. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> so if there's still cookie crumbs from Friday's explosion, my apologies. But from all of the things that, that are done here, isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what we do out there as well. And he was talking about, you know, the, the working of helping people day in and day out. And that's what you all are doing today. You're coming in. I Hopefully you, you, you received a word that that word is going to fill you up. It has strengthened. It's part of what God put into the vine, from the vine, that the word that is coming to you is from the vine, not from me. And that it will sustain you this week as you are continuing to go and stay tapped into the Lord. Amen. And, and as you find adversity or people that come across your path, these unlovely people um, or loving people that need that, that you will have that to give. Amen? Let's all stand. Do you want to come up as you said? Oh, okay. I had decided. If, uh, You're not on. Well, I will be. Yep, there you are. I had decided if I was going to come up. What I do know is I'll look different next week. Praise the Lord. But I want to talk about something that she talked about that is so important for us. And it, it really spoke to me. One, one thing is, uh, you know, the love of my life has unconditional love. She doesn't care what time it is and what, what I need. She takes care of it. Um, but... All the things that are going on with, uh, by the way, they, they, uh, they got all of it, I'm clear. So, uh, it, uh, but, but something she said about trust, and she knows. Wednesday when I went in, and all I had was a, a hole in my nose where they had taken a basal cell out. I looked at the doctor and I said, why don't you just do a skin graph? And he says, that'd look horrid. At that minute, I didn't care because I didn't want all this. And, uh, but, I think sometimes we don't trust God enough that we realize, hey, when I went to sleep, I had to trust the doctor was going to do what was best. And when I woke up, it was worse than I thought it was going to be. 
But I had a complete trust in him and realizing that it's going to be better than it ever was. And I thought I was going to look all deformed and he did a wonderful job. Um, yeah, it looks kind of tough right now. I can tell you the worst part is, is it itches terribly. And I'm not allowed to touch it. So, um, you know, that's, that's the one thing I need is, is sleep. Uh, which is why I didn't get here so quickly this morning, because I stayed in bed too long, because I finally went to sleep, and, and my wonderful wife let me uh, just stay, and, and whether I got here on time, and I missed the kids, and I really didn't want to miss the kids. But it's important for us to realize there's places that we trust that we should trust even more in Him. And realizing, you know, I let a guy put me to sleep that I'd only met one time. I let him cut on my face that I'd only met one time. How many times have you met your father? How many times have you just said, God, I just trust you? Do you really trust him? And it made me reflect on a lot of things as I as I went through this um, and realizing that God loves us so much that all we have to do is just trust. And, and that place that, that she was talking about, what a word. I mean, trust. I look at, uh, and I do tell her she works too hard, but I realize that all of the things that are going on. You may not know what all is going on here at the church now. The, the, the 4-H group that she, she used to do, she took back, and it's going on at this church. Um, 4-H archery is moving to this church. And do you know what that's going to do? That just gives us the opportunity for more outreach. By the way, Youth, we haven't forgotten about the, the, the uh, and we're not putting off the uh, basketball court. I'm, a, according to what the cement guy told me, I'm still a little bit short, but I'm believing that we're just, that seat's just multiplied and, and we're going to put it in, in, in the next, uh, you know, as soon as it warms up enough that we can pour concrete again. But, I'm just looking at what God's doing and what God's doing through this body. Not just through Kathleen. Not just through me. And uh, um, by the way, it's good to be home. Even though I didn't preach today, I enjoyed the word. Um, and I am glad to be home. And I'm glad for a wife that knows how to, to uh, be a pastor. She does know how to rest, too. I know where to find her if I can't find her. I hope you've listened to the word uh, during this service so that you can have your life changed. You're, you'll see how the DNA of your entire life is about to change. Also, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never made him the Lord of your life. Paul says this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's very simple to do that. All I have to really do is say, Jesus is the Lord of my life and I believe that God raised him from the dead. That's exactly what Paul said. Many times we have people pray a prayer uh, so that we know that we've drawn a line in the sand and we've let everybody know that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So I want to do that with you right now so that you can literally say, today is the day, and whatever time it is, wherever you're at, watching, 
you'll know that you've had a change in your life. So say this with me. You can bow your head and close your eyes or you can keep your eyes open. Uh, and uh, I, I always love what uh, Oop Schroner, who is a prophet of God, said. He said, if you're drowning in a swimming pool at the Holiday Inn, you wouldn't want anybody to close their eyes. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're literally drowning in a swimming pool of sin someplace. So say this with me. Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for me. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me of them. And Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. And I commit today that I will live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, if you just did that, then what you just did is you invited Jesus Christ to live in your life, to be the Lord of your life, and you're going to see a complete change in every area of your entire life right now. If you've watched this broadcast, you also know that uh, what we've talked about at different times uh, through different broadcasts is, is finances. If we, the Bible tells us in Luke 6.38 that if we give, that he'll give back to us, press down, shaken together and running over to make room for more. Then it says, uh, right after that, and this is Luke 6, 38. Then it says, whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. So if you become a covenant partner with us today, there's many things that we do for outreaches here out of this church and out of the ministry. Not only here in Weatherford, Texas, but all over the country and all over the world. We uh, have rodeo events right here in the arena where we have, uh, he paid your fees. Simply means that nobody pays to, to enter. They come, we have a devotional, it becomes an outreach opportunity. And we do that in rodeo arenas, horse show arenas, and roping arenas all over the United States. We drill wells and have uh, crusades in Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And by doing each one of those, uh, you become, and becoming a covenant partner with this ministry, you become a part of those outreaches. You take part in the reward in the end time, as well as you get back pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more. Because you're a covenant partner, and this is good ground. Bible tells us in another place he gives back. Uh, this is in uh, Mark, the 10th chapter. It tells us that he gives back to us some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Well, this ground has been worked. It has is, is been fertilized. And, and I would expect a 100 fold return on that. So there's a uh, website that you've seen. Do two things. One, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let us know at that website address and we'll send you some information so that you'll be able to walk that walk and succeed in life in your new Christian life. Also, if you give, there's a donate button right there. If you press that donate button and give, that seed gets planted into good ground, and it comes back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Kathleen and I pray every day over every partner of this ministry. So I want to make sure that we're able to pray for you and, and let us know the things that you may have need of in life so that we can bring them before the Father. Have a great day. Remember, Jesus loves you. We love you. And Jesus is Lord.